I want to mention uh, Diane. Diane pointed out that we're meeting in person next week, and I, uh, for our service of lamentation, and we will be hosting um, two or three Palestinian families. Um, so uh, let's uh, let's come and be supportive of them and one another. This series, what happens after the atrocities? Um, part two is something that I foresee talking about more in the future. I don't know how often and how long into the future, but I do know that um, I had to cut out a lot of what was on my mind, what's flowing through me. Um, so this is not going to be exhaustive of of my meditations. In April of 1967, Dr. King delivered his seminal speech at Riverside Church condemning the Vietnam War. I was 12 years old. And I wasn't aware of that event. I was aware that during I, I was aware that during the same month, April of 67, one of my childhood heroes, Muhammad Ali, who had been drafted a few months earlier, refused to be inducted. Now, King and Ali were in no way the first to speak out against the war. The war was already unpopular with many young people, especially. But this stand cost King popularity, even among African-American leaders, and ultimately he paid with his life. Ali lost a, a fortune and a big chunk of his career. And I still marvel at how hated they were and how beloved they became. Well, right now, we are in a similar place. It's young David standing up to the Goliath of industry and war. What are the odds? What can a youth accomplish? We need to realize, though, how the magic of youthfulness can turn caterpillars into butterflies. Have you ever been to Disneyland? I was seven years old when my dad first took me. Disneyland at that time was, was only eight years old. The bumper cars, the monorail, so many attractions thrilled me. But what I loved most, maybe a bit naively, was it's a small world. To see images of happy kids representing the world in multiple languages was fascinating. So can you think of a childhood experience that made you lose yourself? And then as we get older, we find our children to be intoxicating. And to this day, nothing has given me more joy in life than watching my own kids at play. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 19, some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could lay hands on them and pray for them because, I mean, who doesn't want their kids to be blessed? But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering Jesus. You see, the disciples were still under the influence of the old order that held women and children as second-class people. The disciples wanted to prevent Jesus from blessing the kids. We all need to make sure that we are not stuck in some old order that tries to stand between God's blessing and people that we don't think deserve respect or attention. But then Jesus said, let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. 
and he placed his hands on their heads and blessed them before he left. Take a moment and try to think of a group, a demographic, or an entity that doesn't deserve to be blessed. Because those are the very ones whom God wants to bless and show off to the world as divine exemplars. Right now, the children of Gaza are being deprived of food, shelter, medical care. And listen, just as vital as all of that, they are deprived of the freedom to play. This torments their families. Makes me think of um, the World War II movie, Life is Beautiful. I don't know if you saw that, but it's where a Jewish father and son are separated from the mother and they are taken to a concentration camp. Determined to shelter his son from the horrors of his surroundings, Guido, the, the, the dad, convinces his son that their time in the camp is merely a game. But it was not a game. And what has been happening to Palestinian children for 76 years is not a game. And today they are being ethnically cleansed. This is why we're going to hold a service of lamentation a week from today. Now, you may have heard that the Republic of South Africa went before the world court this past week with a genocide case against the state of Israel. We should not be surprised that countries that were colonized stand in solidarity with Gaza and with South Africa. We should not be surprised that any country that does not carry the burden of settler colonialism with a need to hide from its conscience stands with Gaza. But especially, especially the country of the late President Nelson Mandela, who said, we are proud as a government and as the overwhelming majority of South Africans to be part of an international consensus taking root that the time has come to resolve the problems of Palestine. Archbishop Desmond Tutu wrote, the sustainability of Israel as a homeland for the Jewish people has always been dependent on its ability to deliver justice to the Palestinians. I know firsthand that Israel has created an apartheid reality within its borders and through its occupation. The parallels to my own beloved South Africa are painfully stark indeed. If a country can have moral authority, it is likely South Africa, more than any other country, can bring this case to the International Court of Justice. South African Blacks remember what it's like to face brutal policing. Palestinians also understand this. And how can we forget in the year 2014, after a militarized police force invaded Ferguson, Missouri, Palestinians took to the streets of Gaza and the West Bank with banners that read, Black Lives Matter. We are all concerned for the safety, the well-being of our children. Who doesn't want to see their children blessed? And yet, you and I are collectively responsible for destroying the dreams of children. Maybe you saw photos of former U.S. Vice President Mike Pence during his visit to Israel, signing weapons intended for the shelling of Lebanon. We are appalled, and yet your signature and mine are on bombs and missiles being used against children. We need a way out of our complicity. And let us pray for all people who have been seduced by the false comfort of evil, specifically the three evils named by Dr. King, who said, 
The triple evils of poverty, racism, and militarism are forms of violence that exist in a vicious cycle. They are interrelated, all-inclusive, and stand as barriers to our living in the beloved community. When we work to remedy one evil, we affect all evils. All three of the, the evils that Dr. King mentions involve violence. The thing that first inspired Dr. King's nonviolent views came from an essay when he was in graduate school that he read again, written by Henry David Thoreau over a century before King. It was the idea of refusing to cooperate with an evil system. Thoreau did not name poverty, racism, and militarism, but his ideas were analogous to King's. He wrote civil disobedience to protest what he perceived great injustices committed by the American government, namely the perpetuation of slavery in the South and the U.S. invasion of Mexico. Thoreau was arrested and jailed for refusing to pay taxes to support these causes. In his essay, he wrote that if an injustice of government is of such a nature that it requires injustice to another, you should break the law and let your life be a counter friction to stop the machine. I'm just about done here, but I have to ask myself, what am I willing to do so that children can play. I love having fun. I enjoy games. But what can I do to create a world where children can play? Our children today, they don't need to visit Disneyland to see all the nationalities. They, they live in neighborhoods and, 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 and attend schools with, with all of these folks. And my sisters and brothers were so close. We're so close to Dr. King's dream. It's a little late for his four little children, but we are so close to seeing a generation of children living in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. To you who are elders with us today, hang on a little longer. And you will have grandchildren and nieces and nephews who are Christian, Muslim, Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist, and traditional religions. You may have relatives who are atheists, agnostic, and Wiccan. You're going to have family members who are African, Asian, Pacific Islander, Caribbean, indigenous, and European. In this convulsing world, where it feels like anything could happen, that everything could break at any time. It's young people and it's children who can best see that it's a small world after all. When, when Jesus rebuked his disciples, he was not turning against them. He was saving them too. Mm-hmm, Jesus saves. You can be sure that when South Africa rebukes Israel, they are not anti-Israeli, they are not anti-Semitic. South Africa is seeking to save political Zionists too. There are people, maybe you know them, but there are people, including African Americans, who are gainfully employed in positions of power and advancing empires, who can be saved, but for the moment they are standing between young people and their blessing. So before despairing, and there is so much to despair, just don't you stop earnestly seeking God to help you recover your youthful imagination. You might also find physical rejuvenation. You can be born again. In spite of the atrocities that weigh you down, and you even feel them in your body, 
This world is so full of possibilities. Consider this. We are seeing people who are more global than any humans ever. Talking about a kind of post-nationalistic existence. And even with all of the online dangers, a voice that I respect recently mentioned that young folks are doing foreign policy on TikTok that traditional media ignores. So I can see what Jesus was getting at when he told his disciples who had lost touch with their true selves, get back to where you once belonged. Jesus loved these men, but they were standing in the way of the future. Jesus has a special blessing for the young. And if you're not young, he wants to bless the young at heart too. He wants to spread. He wants to spotlight the young among us because you represent tomorrow. You see things. You represent a world that is yet to be. Many, many protesters in our times chant, this is what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. But what we really need is how Jesus frames our desire. He reaches out to the children and he says, this is what heaven looks like. Well, standing against a war cost Martin Luther King his life because wanting more infuriates some folks. Right now, idealistic protesters are being harassed they're being arrested and jailed. They're being shunned. They're being fired. But I hope that they remind us of that young man named Jesus 2,000 years ago who was turned away. According to Luke chapter 4, the people, when they heard these things, they were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out, not just out of the place of worship, but out of the city. And they led him to the brow of a hill on which their city was built that they might throw him down over the cliff. His own people wanted him gone. They wanted him disappeared. They wanted to get past him. What did he say that was so offensive? He read the scroll of their own prophet. The spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released. The blind will see, the oppressed will be set free. And that the time of the Lord's favor has come. And then Jesus said, the scripture you just heard has been fulfilled this very day. Jesus wanted them to know the future is here. He not only wanted them to know that he was the one they'd been waiting for, but that they were the ones they'd been waiting for. He wanted them to see what heaven looks like. May we realize that we are the ones that we've been waiting for. Let's pray. God of my mothers and fathers, I bless everyone listening to be as young as they want to be. And I ask today for the opening of hearts and the opening of eyes that all the world would awaken to the reality that Palestinians as a people will arise and they will flourish. They will not go away. And we stop to bring before you the victims of atrocities, the dead, the displaced, the missing, the injured, the starved, the diseased, the separated, the stripped, the imprisoned, people who have lost 30, 40, 100 family members. We bring to you groups like Doctors Without Borders and Doctors Against Genocide. We bring before you Jewish Voice for Peace, and if not now, and Jews against genocide. 
We bring before you people whose dependency on media, media echo chambers, keep them from celebrating the dignity of Palestinians like Israelis and Americans confined to propaganda loops. And we bring before you Israelis and Jews. We thank you for those who have recovered their own humanity and love for all humanity. And we pray for those whose hearts are hardened that you would bring liberation to them as well. Amen. Well, um, I once again um, had imagined, envisioned Robina helping us with this part um, to help us in the conversation. And 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 she's still sick. She uh, um, she's still being treated uh, and dealing with a number of struggles within her household. So let's uh, continue to remember her. And by the way, Diane Diane Fox is back in Santa Barbara. She got back Thursday, and then wound up Friday back in the hospital here. Uh, the doctor was not as alarmed as she was, um, but she's very tired. You know, heart surgery is no small thing. After the atrocities, part two. I know somebody here has, has something on your heart. Constina's hand is up. So when you said that our names were on the bombs that stung, and then too, when you talked about our complicity, uh, that stung too. And it makes me feel like, what, what can I do? What more can I do? Um, what am I willing to allow it to cost me? Uh, like you spoke of Muhammad Ali and Dr. King. Um, and I know my heart is willing, you know, to let it cost. It's, I don't know why I get so emotional. Yeah. Every day. <laughs> yeah. You know, I just want direction. God, what, how, where, who, you know, I mean, I can write letters, but I just don't feel, I mean, I want to publicly make statements about the atrocities in the world today and not really worry about what it, and I don't really worry about the cost. I'm just more focused on what can, what more can I do? You know, besides maybe not supporting um, businesses that support genocide, you know? Um, so I, I feel, I feel your message. I, I want to walk uh, with that, with that word and thank you for it. Amen. Asmin's hand is up as well. I, I put in the chat, when you said that you were getting ready to wrap it up. I was like, keep going. Because, <laughs> uh, um, so needed. And, uh, I, I agree with what Constina said, and wrestle with that, that it's not just with regards to the militarism that exists that our country, you know, has all over, everywhere. Um, the Involuntary nature of um, sitting under a government that perpetrates so much evil, um, and then that it's done in our names, right? I think that the least we can do is speak to that and, and acknowledge it every opportunity that we can. Um, 
because there's too many folks that uh, like you said, they're in the echo chambers. So thank you for your message. It's a blessing. That's me. I'd like to I got a little something. I'm gonna I'm gonna channel my my inner Rosie real quick. And uh there was a there's a there's a quote by Stokely Carmichael that he, you know he is often a, a critic of uh, Martin Luther King, and he he applauded Martin Luther King for his his nonviolence and his 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 passion, desire, and his its effectiveness. Um, but Stokely Carmichael said the nonviolence only goes so far because what nonviolence expects is it expects people to have a conscience, and people that are enacting. Um, the level of violence that we're seeing on our TVs don't have a conscience. And that was said in, in um, 1968, I believe. And um, so I, I think that kind of rings true now. And so my, my inner Rosie is saying, we need to pray for the souls of these people. We need to pray for the conscious, the spirit, for God to be shown to these people. Uh, and, and we need to pray for our enemies, but we can't make them our enemy. We have to then see mm. ourselves and then we have to, we have to love them. We have to invite them in and, and show the love of God to them. And uh, yeah, there there is hope. And uh, I, I think the the consciousness of, of people can can come out. But um, yeah, nonviolence does require people to have a conscious. Ah, yes, you're reminding me of uh, the words of Desmond Tutu, who said that if you want peace, don't talk to your friends, talk to your enemies. Yep. Yep. Hmm. And you know, uh, one uh, you know, as Constantina appealed for, you know, response options. Let's ask Palestinians. I mean, we will have some in our midst next week. Um, we're seeking to support them. I mean, this is, they are our people, but the people who are being genocided are their people directly, you know, their, their family members. Um, so, uh, I think it's, it behooves us to connect. I don't know what kind of uh, um, options there are in other locations. This past Thursday, I was at a rally at the Santa Barbara Cou uh, Courthouse celebrating South Africa for their case against Israel. Linnea. Okay. Um, yeah, I put a couple things in the chat. Um one is an organization in Israel. Well, it started within Israel, but it's it's grown all over the world as anti-Semitism and and so on, and the violence has increased. But it's um, working together, Arabs and Jews working together. Dot org. And then this morning, um, I kind of stumbled onto an account uh, on Instagram, Motaz Azaiza. And he's, he was, he has been recording the children and others in Palestine. Um, the thing about Instagram is you, you can't get dates. <laughs> and so, you know, the accusation always comes up that, oh, people are just rerunning atrocities from prior conflicts and stuff like that. So I have yet to check into that. So Thank that's you. in the chat. Thank you, Linnea. I see Barbara's hand. And Scott's hand went up, I think, at the same time. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> I no, I just wanted to say something real quickly. I just so thank you so much for the message this morning. I really needed to be kind of 
reminded again. And I appreciated Constina's comments as well, because I felt like I felt the same thing. The comments stung, but in a really, you know, in a positive way for me, I I feel like with, especially with the upcoming election that's going to be coming up, um, you know, our, I feel like so many people, even in my own circles of whatever you want to label, you want to put on it, are explaining, justifying why the current administration has to be at the table, giving money. Well, that's where I feel like the blood is on my hands. Like my taxpayer dollars, they're going to those bombs. There, there's no, there's absolutely no excuse. Why? Why do we have to? Why do we have to pay for more militarism and the 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 furthering of the violence? So I, you know, which kind of leaves me in a quandary, right? All of us. It's like, okay, so where does my vote go? But I mean we do have some place at the table with our small votes and that's just a small piece of it and then also obviously with protesting letters but i just kind of want to bring that up and just questioning you know our current administration is absolutely a hundred percent at the table giving money for the bombs for the violence thank you for mentioning that barbara when when I was uh, uh, preparing for th this message today, what was on my mind was um, some of you may have seen the the news coverage of President Biden campaigning at Mother Emanuel Church. And there was a small group of young people who stood up and um, they essentially interrupted him saying things like, you know, free, free Palestine or uh, cease fire now, cease fire now. And that's what was on my mind when I recalled the, the story in Luke chapter four, where Jesus, Jesus basically got chased out of his place of worship. Um, and I thought of that as they were being escorted out instead of being engaged. And then later I heard uh, the activist and politician, um, Nina, I um, oh, can't remember her name, but uh, she said, if, if you can't call for Im if you can't call for morality in church, especially a black church, then where can you call for morality? Um, you know, they they were escorted out in the crowd, which I, I, I do not presume was the congregation of that church, but constituents, you know, Democrats started chanting four more years, four more years. That's all I have to say about that. Scott. Um, it's so funny. Barbara's in our hand. My hand went up at the same time. And I'm, I was going to say almost exactly the same thing that Barbara said. Uh, I have a moral dilemma. Can I vote for Joe Biden? Um, I find him. He is a war criminal. We are, as a nation, a war criminal. Um, when he was a candidate for the presidency, he said he would change the policy of a first nuclear strike. And he changed, he went right with the military and he believed in his written in policy, um, the nuclear posture, that we are capable and may use a first strike, even against, um, or we, yeah, simple as that. I had written to Salud Carbajal um, a while ago, uh, crying, demanding for um, a, a length letter saying, you you need to support the ceasefire, because he did not. He wrote back with the same kind of similar letter, like um, explaining reasons why we can't just have an automatic ceasefire. Uh, so I have a moral dilemma about voting for him. 
spend on one to vote for. Um, well, I would never vote for certain other people who are running against both those candidates. Um, and yeah, we can, I know there's a, there was some discussion about, well, do I vote for Grinnell West? He's not exactly nonviolent himself, really a, a great person and leader of um, social justice. And uh, and then you're criticized because, oh, you're going to, you're going to be a part of that pulls away to vote that actually helps put Trump um, in office because of electoral college and blah, blah, blah. So it is, um, you know, it's a mess and it's really hard. And um, a vote for Joe Biden, in my mind, is an immoral act. And and then we go down, you know, the lane. Well, what's you got to be practical. You know, you can't. Um, so it's very hard for me. And I don't know um, where I'll end up of all this. But, you know, I, I'm going to say something positive. Um, David, you made me think of New York because I got to see it's a small world before you did World's Fair in Queens, 1964. Yeah. yeah. And the second time I saw it in my life, the first time I went to Disneyland in California, and it was the fifth birthday of my son. Um, and I got to see that with them. So I appreciate that. But um, I also like to think about Diane Fox because I think maybe not everybody knows that she was at um, Martin Luther King's Beyond Vietnam speech in the church, um, which I just find a wonderful aspect. Anyway, I'll leave it. Yeah, we, we have such a resource and treasure in, in Diane Fox. You know, she used to work with the Black Panthers up in the Bay Area. Um, you know, I... I I hope we really value her experience and, 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 you know, we pray for her continued health and, uh, and joy in life. Um, uh, I was going to, you know, reflect on what you said first, Scott, but then what you said at the end kind of made me forget what you said at first. Um, Oh, Congress. Okay, so legally, if I want to stand, if I want to be legal as a pastor, I can't do any, you know, I can't promote any candidates, right? But let me just say that um, technically we are not at church. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and when I was, uh, I, I knew of her before, but, um, um, there is a, uh, someone vying to, to take the, the, uh, the seat that Salud Carbajal holds, Helena Pascarella. Um, she's anti-war and she has shown up for, um, pro-Palestine, pro-peace events, and she was there, and she asked everybody who was there to to tell just ten people about her campaign, because she doesn't have the money. I mean, Salud Carbo has money from the defense industry, um, and from um, the um, um, ADL uh, anti defamation. Uh, league and 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 she's just doing it because her heart is in it so uh Linnea's hand is up and then i just wanted to say that robina robina's has... i didn't even know robina was on yeah she put something in the chat which we don't always look at but... oh, okay if it's okay, I did have a few comments to make first and foremost. Pastor, this is the second time during the MLK celebration that I have been unable to contribute. You asked me last year as well. <laughs> but um, I did go back this morning to watch the first part of um, the sermon. And I wanted to get back to what your key point was using what I've learned from you over the past few years, but particularly 
the past few months. You began last week by referring to um, <clears throat> Israel and the Jews, and there have been almost no conversation that I participated in or listened to since October 7th that does not begin by apologizing for Jews. And what I learned from you a few months ago was if we told our stories or retold our stories, especially about these atrocities and violence from a Hagar point of view, we would begin with the Palestinians. If we told the story of genocide of Palestinians, not this time, multiple times, even according to the biblical record, which involved genocide and clearing away and killing away of those that were already there, we would tell a different story. What we would feel after these atrocities would be a different feeling. Mm. So that was my first point. The next point is what is it that we do? We do live under a government and a system where we have certain obligations. And when our political system does not work for us, maybe it is time to withdraw from that political system. We know neither the Republicans nor the Democrats will deliver anything that is different. When I became a citizen, I knew this. I refused to register as a Democrat because the foreign policy was violent then. It will continue to be violent many, many unfortunately years to come. And so I think it is our personal responsibility to begin to do democracy, if that's what we uh, believe in, or community, to begin to do it differently. And how do you do that? You do begin with yourself. Begin the story. Begin not with Israel and the Jews and apologizing for them, because it has been almost a century in recent times, not in olden times, of their doing what they are doing. If I were a Palestinian Christian today, what would I be feeling with my belief in Christ, with my belief in the Creator? What would I be saying to the Lord? I don't want us as Christians to infantilize the Palestinians as if they were children. They don't come after, they come now. Mm -hmm. So I want us to be able to say, if I were a Palestinian Christian, not a Muslim, because maybe that's a little bit different, if I were a believer in Christ and a Palestinian today, what would I say? to the Lord and to my larger community worldwide, which would help me understand this a little bit differently. And if it means personally that I do not vote, the only time I voted Democrat was for President Obama. The second time I refused to vote for him because the policies were the same. In fact, he lost a wonderful opportunity with a massive majority in Congress to not change, but to give in to the Republicans. And so I think we bear a responsibility. It's a moral, it's an ethical, it's a responsibility of faith to be different and to act differently. And so I think I'll just leave it uh, there. Thank you. Thank you, Rabina. Uh, I appreciate your voice, not just as a political scientist, but um, but also as a, um, as an immigrant. Um, yeah, we 
They will make a safe happen. Jacobo, yes, please. I'm sitting here on because I needed the passion of Brown Red Wooding from Brighton, but as I as I is young my services this keep me independent and keep me working I need to build democratic because I don't trust the Republicans when them need to keep me in and I'm just sitting here struggling and I think that with all due respect to you guys, you don't, many of you, I'm not good to say anything. You know, I can respect that, Jacob. You make me think of... Um... <laughs> When, when uh, Dr. King in uh, in early two thousand eight, February, I mean two thousand eight, nineteen sixty eight, early nineteen sixty eight, he had already gone to to Memphis for the sanitation workers, and there were numerous death threats that were leveled against him if he would return. And he was asked, why are you going back to Memphis? And his response was that I'm going back to Memphis for those who cannot speak for themselves and those who will not speak for themselves. And essentially, this is a reality of life that, yeah. that a lot of people, their, their livelihoods depend on the system. Yeah. Uh, and 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 it's functioning at some level, even if it's an inferior yeah. level. So I think that I'm glad you spoke up because that's just a reality. I um, mean, not to interrupt, but I will be interested in talking with anybody about being a person with a disability would look like for me if all the services are being cut. I don't see any way out of like functioning without the democratic Body and I'm scared of it, so I would love to engage with somebody about what would happen to me if all my services were cut. Yeah, you know, it's it, boy, this could uh, we're 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 coming up on uh needing to to close today but i you know i i often think about in this context jacob of um in jesus's own time jesus spoke out against the temple he he spoke against the temple economy he he drove out the money changers and nearly 50 percent of the people in jerusalem were employed in the temple construction project so that's what the system does. I mean, it's it can be it can be consuming like that, and so we can't expect everyone to be in the same place. I'm going to go ahead and and um, let Kenichi lead us in communion. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> very, very complex, um, but is much appreciated. We don't shy away, but we we sharpen one another. And in the midst of differences, I know that we come from different places. We find ourselves in different social locations and contexts. And 
um, and at different levels of shedding um, empire from our conscience and our minds. And um, one thing that has helped me personally is what uh, the late LaDonna Brave Bull once told a crowd of people because they, she knew that when we, when we confront system, if we are tr really true to ourselves, and I really applaud people who have gone their ways to shed a uh, system of their, out of their lives and livelihoods and every aspect, I really, really respect and, and, and applaud. But the fact is, I know that I can stand right here and speak against um, materialism and capitalism and so forth. But if one were to instigate, you know, investments and stuff that I am involved in, they probably could find a whole lot of stuff that I'm connected. But what LaDonna Brave Bull said, take one step at a time, one step, shed one step, shed one thing at a time. And, and move forward. And I know that I'm talking to, I know I'm preaching to the choir here and I know that uh, we are people who have gathered, who desire to do that. And, and perhaps, you know, to reimagine and to dream together. Um, and so I just wanted to make mention of that. And uh, Robina, again, thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who contributed. So relevant. Thank you to everybody. So having said that, as we come to the Lord's table, the one thing that uh, continually, recurringly uh, came to my mind was um, just as Muhammad Ali was stripped of his title and lost uh, and really paid economic price. Um, and, you know, Martin Luther King paid with his own life. Um, Jesus, uh, who modeled this, the young man Jesus, lost his life standing against uh, empire and was the very thing that, that nailed him. The state nailed him to the cross. And thereby, as we continually have said over and over on this platform, um, I personally believe more than anything else, he exposed the, the, the uh, insanity, um, yeah, absurdness, but I would say insanity of human violence um, incurred on one another, that we will turn on one another using weapons. He really exposed that and made, us, made it a spectacle for all of us and now invites us to join him in that moral way, if you will, the another way of living as human beings, uh, the love, uh, the way of love, um, way of justice with uh, love as foundation. And so I want to invite us to, to come to the table as we first um, take uh, the broken body of Christ. Let's all partake. And in the shed blood of Christ, let's partake. And as we do, we are saying, yes, we'll go in this way, another way. Amen. And just before we 